Tonight's guest is a musician of extraordinary versatility and talent, well on his way to legendary status, Grammy and Oscar winner, Herbie Hancock. Herbie. Oh, thank you. <laughs> your mom, I read, gave you your love of music. What's she like? Well, she didn't really give me my love of music, you know. I mean, you, nobody can give That's that, true. that to you. Yeah. But what she did was, which was extraordinary, was that she recognized that I was interested in music. Uh -huh. And she did something about it. I would always, when I was about six, my best friend had a, a piano. And I would go to his house every day. And, and <laughs> anyway, I was going to his house every day before he got the piano. <laughs> but but what happened, and when he got the piano, I'd go to the, his house and walk through the door, go right to the piano and start banging on it. I couldn't play. Uh -huh. you know? just started banging it. on it. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, one day my mother said, uh, be nice if you actually told him hello and said, <laughs> how are you doing, you know? You know, anyway, she, she noticed that I, I liked the piano and then on my seventh birthday, I, they, my folks got me a piano. Wow. You know, I, I remember cool. the piano coming into the house. I remember my father had a truck at that time and he and his brothers were bringing the piano out of his truck. And I'm looking out the window and I said, Mom, who's that for? You know, and she says, that's for you, son. And I went, oh. Uh, I couldn't, I couldn't believe it, yeah, you know. Yeah. Well, I'll bet she's ago. real pleased she made that move, huh? <laughs> well, now she is. She, it was funny because um, when I first started playing jazz, that was okay as long as it was kind of on the side, you know, but she, she wanted me to have, quote, culture, right? Uh-huh. And so that meant, you know, classical music, you know, the whole European thing. Right. You know? Well, so, you were in the Chicago Symphony Orchestra at 11. Actually, I wasn't in the orchestra. What happened was um, I won a, a contest, you know, like the Young People's Concert Series. And the prize was to play the concerto that I auditioned with, uh, with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. Now, the, the interesting thing was I received this postcard in the mail that said, congratulations, you won, and your date to play is February 5th, 1952, which was great. It says, however, Unfortunately, we can't not find the parts for the orchestra uh, to that concerto, so you'll either have to pick a different concerto or forfeit the date. So I picked a different concerto, so I had to learn a whole new concerto. Mm -mm. And so, so I, did, I did perform it. The next week, I went to see a very famous pianist uh -huh. perform with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. Her name is uh, Myra Hess. Mm -hmm. Guess what she performed? Your old one. The concerto. <laughs> that they couldn't find. For. Right, exactly. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Doing that to an 11 year old kid. That's pumpkin. My, yeah, right. That sucks. My <laughs> piano teacher was ready to kill somebody. I bet. You know. I'll but bet. anyway, I did Probably it. you in the fun. neighborhood. You majored in engineering college, which is pretty <laughs> bizarre. <laughs> and uh, then you switched to music composition. Right. Right? How did that help you, engineering help you in music? In your well, music? first of all, um, I was interested in science even before I became interested in music, you know, uh -huh. like when I was five. Uh -huh. So that's always, I've always had these two interests, music and science. I was good in math. I was really great in math. Right? And so I wanted to be practical when I went to college and study something where I thought I could actually get a job. <laughs> You know, and music, that's so... Um, like being an actor. Yeah, exactly. It's Art. It's kind of worried. frivolous when you think you might be able to succeed. So, But then after two years of doing what really isn't my main thing, I looked in the mirror one day and I said, who are you trying to kid? You know, so I took the plunge. and So, that, so what happened was I never knew there was a way, there would ever be a way to combine science and music. And then synthesizers came along. And I was immediately not afraid of them. I immediately understood the language. I mean, I only studied engineering for two years, so I didn't learn a whole lot. But the terminology I was familiar with, so. Well, I, they say math is music, right? It's music and spheres, right? They say math, I never. It's uh, related, you know. I well, music it, is math. So. Right. A lot of doctors, for example, were musicians. Mm -hmm. Or you know, are musicians on the side, you know. 
You know, there's some relationship mm -hmm. there, you know. Business people are not musicians. No, not, not, no. It's a whole other thing. We're going to be right back with the uh, legendary musician Herbie Hancock. You went from college into engineering, then you went into jazz with people like Miles Davis right. and uh, Donald Byrd. Right, exactly. Yeah, and then from I, there you went to the synthesizing. Right, exactly. I played uh, with Donald Byrd for a couple of, of years. He's the guy that actually discovered me and brought me from Chicago to New York. Mm -hmm. And then uh, he's also the guy, he was like my big brother. You know, we shared an apartment, and he laughed at me a lot because I was this little green kid fresh out of college, you know, and kind of nerdy because I was into, you know, science and fascinated by everything, you know. And then he introduced me to, to, to Miles. Were those the days of Birdland? I mean, the end of Birdland? Or this in, is, yeah, The great Birdland. jazz days in, like, the late 50s of New York? Yeah, actually, I, 60s, uh, 1960. 60s. That's 60s. the year I went to New York. Oh. First place I played was the old five spot. Whoa. The old the five spot. Mingus's. Yep. <laughs> the real Mingus. Mingus and the Baroness. Yep, right. Did you know the Baroness? Sure. Well, I mean, Nika. I met her. I was scared. She was a legend by the time I got here. Oh, yeah. She 64, was... four. Yeah. So, so, what was so that? Then, and then, you know, I joined Miles, Miles Davis' band in 1963. And I was 23 at the time. The drummer, Tony Williams, was 17. Best drummer I ever heard in my life. It's just yeah. un unbelievable. He's a legend. And he's the first guy to play what's called jazz fusion. Mm -hmm. A lot of people credit Miles Davis's album, Bitches Brew, as being the first uh, attempt at combining the two things. What's jazz fusion? It's combining rock elements and jazz elements. But then you heard the great godfather, James Brown, right? right? Uh, Papa's got a whole new brand, a brand new band. Right, exactly. <clears throat> and you did something after that, right? I wrote a song called Watermelon Man in 1962. Mm -hmm. In 63, it became a big hit with a, a guy named Mongo Santa Maria, a uh, Cuban mm -hmm. percussionist. Mm -hmm. And then uh, um, it, it was the same year that the Beatles emerged. Because right. I found an old Billboard magazine, a trade magazine, mm -hmm. and it has um, uh, uh, the, the Beatles' first al album that came out here. I forgot which, which one. Their first big single. I want to hold your hand or something. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know, one of them. And, and then it had uh, Watermelon Man on, on the same chart. But anyway... Um, well, it was going batty. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but I was basically really a jazz snob mm -hmm. at that time. Especially when I joined Miles' band. See, I, I made my first album before I joined Miles. By the time I got to Miles' band, I was really, like, I didn't want to know from rock and roll. And you boys were snotty. I met a few of you. You were snotty about oh, that Oh, definitely. Jazz. I was, <laughs> we were all trying to be very cool. Too cool. And, yeah. <laughs> and very, you know, passive about things and just play the music, you know. Meanwhile, Miles was listening to everybody. Was he? He listened to everything. You know, he was a Jimi Hendrix fan. And so I thought, gee, if Miles is listening to everything... How, how square can it be? Yeah, right. It must be cool, sort of cool. Exactly. So he, that really helped to open me, open me up. And then when I heard Papa's Got a Brand New Bag, I heard something in the rhythm. I said, I you gotta have it. You could not stay cool yeah, with I said, that. Yeah, you I gotta were have rocking. It. You were moving. Yeah. And then when Sly Stone came out with Thank You for Letting Me Be Myself Again, I said, that's it. I'm I moved. Old. You know, that, that got me, you know. So then I did an album called Headhunters. Right. This was 1973. And... I had no idea what was going to happen with the, with that record, but it became a, a huge uh, success. You know, as a matter of fact, it became the biggest selling jazz album in history wow. at, at that time. Right. So, I mean, I... And were really you synthesizing? Honored. You were starting to then? Yeah. That's the, yeah. That album was the first time I ever played synthesizer. And you were attacked by the jazz purists then, right? Uh -huh. You know what actually happened was, it wasn't so much the jazz record buyers. Right. It was just the critics. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I always have this running joke that you can always tell who the union man is and who the critic is in the audience. How? Yeah. They're the ones that aren't having a good time. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Right. They're the ones there right. observing us like we're animals right. in a cage. Or you know? who the, yeah, who the industry weasels are. Right. The ones that aren't, yeah. Yeah. And they don't pay to get in. See, they don't, they don't pay to get in. And right. they get free records and everything, you know. Right. But and I shouldn't say that about every critic because there are some very yeah. good ones. Yeah, there's some ones that actually you learn from, but they're rare. That's what I think. 
I think criticism, there's, a, there's an element of responsibility that quite often is, is missing. Yeah. They should be really encouraging talent, but I think they forget about that. They think too much about just journalism, you know? Everything should have responsibility attached to it. Yeah, it seems like we don't teach that so much anymore. I know. What it's responsibility is and, and, and where do you take your own and how you make a stand. And, and it's very, very important, especially today. Especially today because we're getting further and further away from each other. That's a big, big problem. And if we don't solve some of these problems that are going to take us even further away, mm -hmm. for example, technology is going to take us further away Always has. from each other. And if we don't solve some of these problems, the whites riots are going to look like a campfire. Mm. You know, yeah, and it's not just going to be African Americans. No. You know, yeah. everybody. So I'm afraid. Of, I'm, white militia, everything. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm actually afraid, for the first time, really afraid of what the future can be if we don't handle this stuff right. And how do you think the way to handle it would be? I think, first of all, the technology community should do one thing that they haven't done. There's, some, there's something missing in the picture of the value of technology. The approach has always been look at this machine and let's see what can we what tools can we make from this machine and then take these tools and go to a human being and say give us your money what what can you yeah yeah you buy this but what can you do with it and then the human being will say gee i can write letters and like do things and move this around and cut and paste and do all of these things faster and uh and i could do my budgets on it and this is a marvelous thing meanwhile the son is in jail, the daughter is product of child abuse, and all of these other things are happening in their actual real life. Yeah. And so I'm saying that the technology community, at least 50% of it, should look first at the human condition and say, how can we use technology to address the needs of humanity? That's never been done. Yeah. And if that happens, it's going to lead to a whole new way of thinking about technology. And it's going to lead to a lot of new industries, cottage industries, and a lot of jobs, and money. You can actually make money from that. Mm. If we don't have that, we're going to have big problems. Plus, we have to get the technology to the people who can't financially afford it. We're going to come back to that. We'll be right back with musical genius Herbie Hancock. <laughs> that uh, people don't take personal responsibility and you think a lot of it has to do with technology or well um no i was just saying that we happen to live in a, a world at this time where technology is really uh, becoming a, a a vital part of how we communicate with each other how we shop um uh, our, our entertainment education all these things mm -hmm. i mean by the year 2000 it's the information age yeah and it may last for a very long time and but what has happened is that technology is going through the roof i mean it's so exciting the things that are possible mm -hmm. but humanity seems to be going in, in the toilet through the toilet you know and so there's something wrong with this picture and i think there needs to be a balance and that technology because it's going to play such a, a vital role in our daily lives should take the helm you know and the balance should be changed. Right now, what technology does is look at machines first and develop tools and bring them to human beings. There's so many things that we need to do for, that have to do with the, what I'm talking about. For example, uh, games. Games are made for boys between, you know, I mean, uh, yeah, you know, electronic games. Right. For yeah. boys between the age of 9 and 15, I think. Mm -hmm. What about girls? What happened to them? Yeah. They don't exist? They don't count anymore? You know? Never did, Herbie, not for the last 4,000 years <laughs> since we got certain kind of uh, religions going for us. <laughs> well, I don't believe that. Boys, I believe women are the school. ones that are running this. <laughs> well, yeah, well, we were the ones that started it, sort of. But oh, what, yeah. uh, <laughs> no, and the boys' rib. games are totally violent. Wait a minute, Complete. you came from my rib. Anyway, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I think you came from between our legs, boy. <laughs> I, think, I think it was called Nature Turned on Its Head by some smart... Uh, yeah. Smart desert folk. Let me set up now. <laughs> <laughs> so. So, yeah. Um, anyway. Oh, where were we? <laughs> I don't know, man. You know what I'm going to go to? I'm going to go to a quote. 
I'm going to go to a quote of yours. You said, Buddhism has helped me toward gaining control over my own destiny and given me the courage to follow directions I believe in. Buddhism. Oh, yeah, exactly. What do you mean well, I, um, I've been practicing Buddhism for about 24 years, you know. I chant nam myoho ho renge kyo uh -huh. if you ever heard of that. You uh -huh, know? Sure. You know, it's the Buddhism of uh, a guy named Nichiren Daishonin, you know. And what Buddhism has, has, through the practice of this Buddhism, it's helped to, help me to, to develop and nourish a support system that comes from my own life. So that it doesn't, so I don't, I don't need so much external praise and external um, um, signs. To see how you're doing. To see how I'm doing so much. Oh, to see how I'm doing, fine. No, but I mean to, to, to for the courage yeah, you don't to do what it. I have to, to, to do what I have to do, you know. And it's both spiritual and physical and material, you know. There's no particular emphasis in this Buddhism on the spiritual. Mm -hmm. Because the thing that gets us in trouble is not necessarily the spiritual. Very often it's, it's the physical. So we need to get all of these things in balance. Don't go away. We'll be back with the great music man, Herbie Hancock. Herbie Hancock. You've been married to the same person for 27 years. Exactly. In the record business, too, of all things, in the music business. Yeah. How did you manage that? Well, my wife, Gigi, and I are not in each other's face 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. That helps. You know. We, I happen to have a job where I travel sometimes. Mm -hmm. She's had to develop something that, okay, well, I had the good fortune to have this kind of a job. Mm -hmm. But what it did, and because of the, the great kind of person she is, she realized that she couldn't depend on me for my happiness. Well, the truth is, well, for her own it's for everybody that yeah. way. Yeah. yeah, of course it is. You know, you, should ha you have to find your own happiness. See? So she found a life for herself so she can be somewhat self-sufficient and in not depending on me uh she has a, a whole life right well she, she's a whole human being you know and uh and she's developed into this incredible wom woman people don't even call the house looking for me anymore everybody wants her she's they, the they want her to house? be around yeah she's the star they, they just like her to, to be around she's like this earth mother that every everybody loves you know yeah. she takes on everybody's problems you know, when people are sick, she's there, you know. Um, uh, when they have problems, they want her over there to tell her. She just takes everything on. You know, if somebody dies, she takes care of things, you know. She's that kind of person. Gigi. Yeah. Um, Plus, she's fine, did, too. She's fine? Yeah. <laughs> Plus, she's fine. That always helps. And you all met when you were young kids, and somehow you came was, to this realization. Because usually that's 20, the thing, that's a mature person. I was 28. That understands that. I was 28 when, uh, no, I was 24 right. when I met her. Right. You know, and uh, so that's, it's been 30, 31 years that we've known each other and been together. Right. It's, it's a long time, you know. Oh, that's wonderful. And we have a daughter, Jessica. That's, a, just, that's wonderful. But the other thing son. is, you have to be tolerant, you know. When you have a marriage of two people, Two whole human beings, and they both have to be different. That's the nature of being a human being. And so, whatever perfection you may have thought that you wanted, you have to start making some adjustments, and you have to really be tolerant of each other, uh, of each other's weaknesses. I mean, it turns out um, that her strengths are my weaknesses, and my strengths are her weaknesses. You know, I have a tendency to get distracted. You know, get absorbed in something and then I lose track of time I lose track of of, of things you know and, and there's a balance that she has that I don't I don't always have you know she can ground you yeah you know. exactly like and she can make rock. sure yeah make sure that I don't go off the track you know mm. and um, but she has a tendency to, to get freaked out by by things and get tense and get and I, I, I don't normally 
<laughs> rolls off you. Yeah, yeah, it kind of rolls off me. Herbie, you're a man who does too many things too well. But it's great <laughs> talking to you. Thanks, Lou. Really? Thanks. Come back again and see us. Well, come back next time. We'll keep you up again.